All right, guys, it's Nolan Walker here with Roofers Paradise. I'm joined here with Justin Woodruff of Roof Central out of Clayton, North Carolina. Uh, hey there, Justin. Um, guys. Hey, how's it going on? Good. Guys, remember to subscribe uh, to everything here. But I want to kind of, I'll, I'll intro Justin here. I feel like Justin and I have quite a bit in common. Um, I just read off your website about your entrepreneurial story at 15 years old. You may not know some stuff. Just, I, I, I walked across the stage at, in fifth grade wanting to be an entrepreneur and all the parents laughed at me. Um, but I guess, um, you know, you did, um, you did direct TV and then home theater. I was in home security and I sold 23,000 alarm systems and, and, uh, that was, and I made a lot of money back then doing home security systems, but it changed and I got into a different business, but yeah, if you don't mind give, you know, what I'd like to talk about is kind of your entrepreneurial journey, which I know there's a ton of entrepreneurs in roofing. I'd like to talk about some good stories, bad stories, favorite stuff, you know, favorite types of jobs to make, how you maintain profitability um and just where the dream's gonna go from here but if you don't mind sharing with me kind of how you got started as an entrepreneur i think it'd be yeah, good absolutely um I, I got started as an entrepreneur when i realized i uh, my parents couldn't pay for everything i wanted so, yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> you know i wanted uh stuff you know right. uh, you know the, the the shoes the bikes you know whatever the kids had so it it uh it started out even earlier than that honestly you know go back to the root uh, i was raking leaves in this trailer park you know uh you know right right across the street from my house where i grew up at yeah you know and i started making money that way and then me and my dad went around with a lawnmower and you know he, he took me around and, and knocked on doors it was pretty cool you know just thinking about that but i used um, to mow lawns paint curbs do all that stuff as soon as i could push a lawn but <laughs> around the age of 14 or so you could push a lawnmower and work you know so yeah hey i loved it when i was done i could say hey look you know here's what we did you know to your lawn and looks beautiful okay cool here's your cash you know right <laughs> Uh, yeah. you, know, you probably do that these days and they'd like, you know, shoot you like a, shoot you like a, uh, a Zelle, uh, uh, request or something. But, uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, uh, it goes back to, you know, raking leaves and cutting grass. And then, uh, you know, after right. that, um, my, uh, my next door neighbor, uh, who I, I grew up with, it ended up being like a second dad to me, uh, cause my dad was a truck driver. He was gone a lot when I was a teenager. Right. He got me introduced to, uh, to audio video, but, but through, um, you know, direct TV. So he, he worked for a company, um, hanging TVs and stuff, doing some really high end automation and theaters and stuff like that. Um, and right. really, really wealthy people's houses. Anyway, uh, I got on board with the company that was putting in all the direct TV satellites in there, uh, back when direct TV was expensive, you know, right. and uh, the receivers were like 1200 bucks each and you had to pay for the installation. Uh, wasn't a race to the bottom then, you know, it's like, you know, I so think anyway. that stuff like that's important. So you said when you put, you know, I, I, re, I would in my uh, upbringing, like I, we were in nicer homes. My parents had business trouble. We got a, but it helps to go even install a satellite in a nice house to go, wow, I wonder what this guy does. How did, how did he get here? Uh, if you don't stick, put yourself out there at all, you never even see, a nicer home or you don't, or it's so distant, you don't think you can do it. Like you, you, once you go install that and look at it, it's like, well, that guy, you know, he doesn't seem that special. <laughs> why, why can't I live in that big, nice house? So it, I get, it helps to do that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I, I, so, I, you know, I, I grew up like that essentially, you know, working in these multi-million dollar homes, like hockey players and, you know, uh, football players and stuff like that. And, uh, just right. seeing how they live and, you know, wealthy businessmen. And I mean, they had some nice stuff, you know, always had good car collections and stuff. So it was, it was cool to do all that. And then I, uh, left, uh, the direct TV installation company I was with and got into audio video, uh, right. hanging my own TVs and stuff. And so, you know, hanging TV surveillance systems and, uh, you know, and then got in the business world and, you know, started doing voiceover IP and networking and stuff like that. Right. And it's really helped me out a lot and growing my businesses now, you know, phone systems and, you know, web stuff. And, you know, just I like to tell these stories just for people listening, because I, I mean, I painted curves. I had some real rough times 
most us guys that get off in business that are doing something really started real low, right? Like we were pretty low totem pole. I just mowing lawns, painting curbs, raking leaves, installing a dish network TV. I mean, that's just low end stuff. You know, that's all, you know, that's all you really can do right at, at that age, but you do what you can do and you start on the journey of it. I don't know, um, you know, roofing, some people get right into roofing, I guess, just from being a salesperson or something like that. But, um, right. but anyway, yeah, go, go ahead. So you get yeah, into there's, there's some, you know, some young kids, you know, getting into it now, you know, door knocking and, and whatnot mm. for residential. So, um, but yeah, so, uh, so did, did audio video for a while. And then I just, I ended up picking up roofing because, uh, my my father-in-law at the time, the ex-father-in-law now, but um, he had mentioned it. Like, There's a lot of money in roofing, you know. And I thought he's like getting up on the roof, and I'm like, right. man, I'm not doing that, right. you know. No way. And then uh, one of my my AV clients uh, owned a flooring store, and he he told me the same thing about roofing. He owns a flooring store, and so um, you know, he and I had, had partnered up for for a little bit, and that's that's how I was introduced to it. Um, and, and you know, it just sort of spilled over from there i started a pretty you know large company and you know uh ended up getting out of that company and then starting you know roof central so so are but, you the sole owner of roof central is it just you it's myself and michael miller okay yeah. and you got a um you got one partner in it so how long have you had roof central for has it been several years now or so roof central this year will be a second year mm. okay yeah. Well, man, things are kind of same. Are you happy with um, everything thus far, as far as growth and projections and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, I really am, actually. Um, you know, Michael does a killer job uh, on the residential side and running our teams over there, and I'm more focused on the commercial end. In fact, I'm actually leaving the Charlotte, North Carolina area now, hopping off of a, a large uh, commercial roof. So. What type of what type of material are you looking at on the roof? What what I, I, that was one of my questions. So, what type of material are you uh, working with on commercial, or will we you? Do, yeah, we do coatings only. So, hmm. you know, I mean, of course, we'll do commercial shingles or you know metal, you know, like a pitch roof. But uh, right. we do coating, you know, and roof restoration. Okay. So this particular roof we just got off of was a. Uh, ballasted epdm and i think you know probably the solution there is we'll probably slide the rock to the side clean it spray some polyurea and then you know slide the rock back so okay all right so you're you're actually gonna suck the the ballast off then put it back on after you're done yeah essentially we'll, we'll probably do it in rows you know like 15 foot rows and we'll just slide it all to one side clean that area all the way to the back gutter uh apply the polyurea and then slide the rock back and, and the rock's some, not going to hurt the uh, the coating that you. What what brand coating do you do you use? So on this one, we do Armor Thane Polyurea. It's a two part, okay. and we'd probably build it up to about a hundred mil, and uh, it dries and you know instantly. I've I've dealt with a lot of roofing stuff, obviously, and but I've never heard of putting the ballast back on. Like so, you'll go on there. So if you don't put that back on, are you worried about the substrate? like lifting in this case or something is, or is there some sort of other concern, uh, with yeah. having, it would definitely lift up for sure. It, okay. it would it, it look like a hot air balloon out there, you know, <laughs> were they originally looking to replace everything and you came in because to save money, is that what's happening here or what, um, were they already looking at a coating? Uh, they originally came to us cause they wanted a TPO layover estimate and we don't do TPO. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we just, you know, informed them of, of our solution and they thought it was great. So, well, I'm sure they've already got, yeah, that's the beauty of coatings. They probably already know how much it was going to cost them and they, they were dreading it and they're asking layover. They don't want to remove the substrate. They're trying to save money already. Right. By, yeah. Uh, by this. Well, um, the, good, the good news is it's hundred percent tax deductible the first year. So that's true. You know, that's it's tax. True. Yeah. One, <laughs> no, <laughs> You're selling me on it, man. I know. So, so yeah, the, the, uh, but yeah, the, the, it's a repair, right? It's not a, it's not an amateurized de deduction. You just get to take the whole thing. We're restoring the roof, not removing it and putting on a new one. So that is hard to pass up as a business owner. Even if you're like, well, I know this other roof would last me maybe 20 years. I'm going to have to recoat this thing in like 10 or, or mm -hmm. whenever, but man, when you're sitting there faced, especially they're a profitable company and they're going to get, 
even a loss carry forward, even if they already got all their deductions for this year, they can carry that thing forward, right? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, we that was the one thing actually uh, that really got us on this roof and, mm-hmm. you know, had a lot of communication <clears throat> communication with this company and they seem to be liking what we're saying and that, that tax code, you know, and that write-off was, was huge for them, so. Are, when you do a roof coating, and I've asked people this before, but are you running about a third material, a third labor, and a third profit on these jobs, or how do you how do you calculate that? Um, yeah, you're talking about in terms of profitability. Profitability. Are you at about a third on these deals? So, so what we'll do is I'm a little bit different uh, from any other uh, company you may talk to. A lot of guys get caught up in like the per square price and whatnot, but. We'll, we'll go out and look at what the best solution is and we will figure determine exactly what our cost is. And then we'll put our margin on top of that, not our markup to understand exactly where we need to be. And, right. you know, on a roof like this, uh, we'd probably be somewhere in like the, you know, probably, you know, probably 40% margin area and, you know, right. probably, you know, gross margin. So. Not bad. It's nice. And it still looks like a great deal to them. Um, so do you, I mean, I, I like personally, I like a lot of different type of roofing concepts. I understand a guy if he's residential only, I understand a commercial only, but I do think I like a roofing company now that I've done this for over a decade that does both because it's just, it's difficult to um, keep going with both of them all year long or to not have ups and downs. And you don't want to lose the hailstorm that comes through or the storm damage that comes through from the, from the residential side because you can get a retirement off of that alone Oh, yeah. I think, and then you have a feast or famine going with some of the uh, commercial deals. But I do talk to a lot of, the, especially the coatings guys. You probably know a bunch of those Conklin guys. They're they're hardcore commercial only. They don't they won't do, they only do what Conklin sells. You know that's it. Um, but I don't know if you're familiar with that group of guys. So you're in North Carolina, so there's not a lot of Conklin guys in North Carolina. I don't think are there. Who, who do you run up against for? coatings do you have less competition for it um you know what uh, no one i don't pay any attention to the competition um honestly uh so I, I have no clue who we go up against i don't ask who we're going up against or it, what company it is or anything so and you know i'm, I'm uh you know off social media now so i, I don't know i don't really monitor <laughs> sort of, i had to we, get off i tell you what i'm not on i still i still get on every once in a while but social media gets me so anxiety stricken I got to just stay on the money, stay on what I'm doing. I get off in the weeds in social media and you think the world's coming in an and you stop running, you know, it's like, I yeah, can't. there's, it's, it's funny in the, in the roofing industry right now, what's going on, you know, like everybody wants to be an influencer and everybody wants to get the most likes and all that. Look, I want to put roofs on, you know, we're the best at what we do. We enjoy it. We're really good at it. We understand the systems and we're confident, you know, and, and commercial and residential and we're divisional. You know, my, uh, you know, residential guys aren't out, you know, trying to, you know, pitch, you know, commercial and, you know, they want to get into that. We'd like for them to make a transition. A friend of mine said the other day who owns two companies, one's a pest control and one's a lawn care service. I asked him if he ever thought about getting into another service industry. And he said, no, that's just too much in order for me to, to be the best. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the best if I, if I got into another one. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah so much and uh, i'm not interested in being a jack of all trades and master of done you know i want to i want to dominate you know one thing that i'll say that i'll give you some credibility on you've got a good brand i'm i'm always big on that i don't take this as a platform to talk about our you know marketing and all that but i I do want to point out that roof central is a great brand you've got a great logo great website of course and I would assume that you have a higher closing ratio. I don't think that I don't think that most guys understand that aspect of it. So you can't just go bid this roof like you like you're doing and be a great salesperson and not back up the rest of it, which is the yeah. comfort to the client of a branded company and that someone's coming with a package more than the sales routine that they received. And so do, do you feel like you have a pretty high closing rate? I would assume you do. We do. Um, you know, the commercial side is a little bit different, but, you know, the residential, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what you say you are, honestly, these days, it's what Google says you are and yeah. who you are. That's what and I'm getting so, at. You know, you know, so if they get a knock at their door and they really like you, you know, but they're, they're sort of, you know, concerned, oh, that's a door knocker. 
and then they look you up and they see you everywhere and you got a nice brand and a nice website and great reviews and some some good backing there you right. know and location helps obviously too you know absolutely they'll it just affirms their decision you know yeah i mean if you get online and i, I won't go into this too much but if you get online and you're branded and you show up you get leads anyway but if you're not branded with reviews and a reputation which is what causes you know optimization but if you you get twofold so you're going to lose both of them if you don't have it you go out and knock doors they don't know who you are and your conversion rate is going to be really low if you go out and knock doors and you're branded online your conversion rate's high plus you get the other leads off of internet shopping traffic because you're optimized so it's a twofold thing you need you need to be branded but once you're branded you also get a side benefit of leads but if you're knocking doors from a hailstorm or something and you don't have a great brand, you're in trouble. Um, I like stuff. Roof Central is, and we never really went into this, but Roof Central is, a, it's just, it's got, it's, it's sounds simple, but it's, it's a different word. It's a good little, it's a simple, good brand. And um, Google likes that, by the way, and yeah. it helps Roof, out. Roofing. <laughs> yeah, they like it. They like that. Um, so, I guess, uh, you know, we were talking once and I'm pretty sure it was you, Justin, who had recommended a book called Who Not How. Was that mm -hmm. you? Yeah. 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 I forget who wrote the book. I did buy it, by the way, and kind of went over it a little bit. Um, Dan but Sullivan. Who is it? Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan. Who Who Not How. I know I, I just listened to a podcast on... Um, I think I was on Tony Robbins and there was a guy that said that was that was tackling when like the most productive time for different tasks. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was, uh, every, you know, but it is interesting. So do you do um, coaching or mentoring or mastermind stuff or do you, are you involved in any of that stuff for this or you just seek out knowledge on your own? Um, I seek out a lot of knowledge on my own, honestly, through, uh, you know, podcasts and, you know, audio books and, you know, real books and, you know, actually the book right now is the Bible. So that, that's actually a good one. Teach you some yeah. good there, you know, life lessons. I but yeah, I, the Bible may be the only non, uh, you know, the only history that hasn't been manipulated for a specific narrative is my, you know what I mean? It's like some yeah. original history, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I absorb as much as I can and I go when I do, you know, never have I tried to perfect something before I actually, you know, go out and do it, you know, because if you're waiting around for perfection to do something, you'll never even start it. And then the guy that's out there only getting 80 percent of it right is just outlapped you. So, yeah, I practice, you know, a lot in my life. Nolan Walker here for Roofer's Paradise. So I'm looking for podcast guests for Roofer's Paradise and I'd like to hear from you. If you're a roofer or somebody in the industry that's looking to talk about their product, I'd like to hear from you. If you're a roofer and you want to tell your story, I'd love to speak with you. Also, uh, we will blog and put a link back to your website, give you a little juice. It'll help you out. And it'd be great for you to get on here and tell your story and just to have it recorded. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Look us up on roofersparadise.show email us and we'll call you back. So what materials do you like using the most? Do you have any favorite materials or I want to ask you a couple of questions too about good stories or bad stories, but if you're on a residential roof, is it shingle almost exclusively? Are you selling anything else, fabricating metal or doing anything, anything different? Or are you just, and, and what type of shingle do you like to sell? Uh, we like to sell Atlas. So Atlas pinnacle pristine, primarily that's the shingle we stick to. Mm -hmm. Um, and that shingle is, uh, it's, it's easy to install. It's much larger, but I think what really sells itself is the, uh, you know, 3M Scotch guard in it right. and at always had our back. I've dealt with them in a previous company and, you know, now over at roof central and, and they really work with you. If there's any problems, they help you out. You know, they got great incentives, you know, uh, being a roofer, but they also have a great product and I've watched it work. Um, but, you know, like I worked a hailstorm in 2017 you know, three years later, you know, uh, these other roofs are streaking and the ones we put on are not. So, uh, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, a lot of guys use Atlas. It's not as well known to the public, but a lot of hardcore roofers will use Atlas, certainty, stuff like that. But, you know, you always yeah. expect people, people don't use, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, guys use GAF and all the other stuff too. 
Well, um, I mean, here's the thing. It's six one way, half a dozen the other, right? I mean, it's it's yeah. like you know, being a car dealer. I mean, what, what car do you sell? You know, I mean, you know, Toyota, Lexus, Honda, they're, they're still very good cars. You know, right. they've all been called. It's just, hey, what do, what do you enjoy selling? You know, mm-hmm. what, what, do you, what do you believe in? You know, and I think that's really important, you know, is what, what you believe in and what you stand behind. It is your roof system, basically. Most guys that are successful that stay in the business will have pride in their work and a roof system and their material. Otherwise, they don't stay in, in business. The guys that I know that are better, one of those characteristics, besides them being hardcore and positive, most, most of the guys that I see over the years that don't do well, they're just negative people, right? They're not being positive. They don't have that positive entrepreneurial outlook. Like, I know, I know what my next step is. And I'm excited about it. I'm willing to work to get there, you know, as opposed yep. to dog and stuff. And then the second thing that I notice about them is that they start to get, and they all, some people will get too serious about it, but the roof system, the materials. And when I say they get too serious about it, sometimes when people get so tunnel visioned on one thing, they tend to make, you know, preconceived ideas about other things like marketing, for example. Um, but, but they still have to believe in a roof system quality of material and back that otherwise it's going to infect everything else reviews reputation uh their ability to sell it like you were saying you gotta you gotta believe in it or you won't make the sale yeah i i think uh as a company you know a brand good branded company you're you're not going to market with a shingle and introducing that first and then saying your name you're going into market with your name you know with with you know, with your business name, with your logo, with all your branding and, and then yourself personally, you know, and then what's behind that are all the products that, that you know, your company believes in. Right. You have and, to have pride in the whole thing, your company, your processes, your ability, your confidence in that, and then the materials and everything else. And people, whether you could fake it or someone else, people have, people can sense that and smell it off of you. And it ends up uh, yeah. not only getting reviews, but getting sales and closing high closing ratios. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I got to pay attention to what you sell, you know, yeah. I mean, there's shingle brands out there that haven't had a good name and, you know, right. you, you want to watch what you sell because you could lose a job before you even know you had it, you know? Right. Uh, and so I think you should definitely research the products before you get into it. But I'll tell you right now, you know, Nolan, there's a lot of change going on everywhere and in the roofing industry as well. So, you know, Lord only knows what's coming down the line. And, uh, you know, a lot of tried and true guys, you know, like, oh, I'm GAF through and through, man. You know, like, right. you know, they out. You know, if innovation's not involved, they may miss out. So I like to stay on top of, you know, what's new, what's creative, you know, based on the job that we're doing and the solution it requires. You know? I talked to a guy the other day on a podcast from Roof Rejuve was you spray on to to extend the life of the roof you know of a shingle roof love that uh, stuff. they claim it works you know i i from a from a money standpoint it seems fantastic because they increase their they he claimed that they'll take like 100 roofs and said and then bid them without it or bid them with it claims that they have an 18 percent increase on conversion on a shingle and the 18 percent increase is only on the product meaning they didn't lose any of their replacement shingles, but they gained the rejuvenation in addition to on a bump. And they had it at like a 60% profit margin. Um, but, you know, somebody goes out and makes 1200 bucks on, on one of these deals. A great solution. Um, you know, I, I, my partner and I were talking the other day and we said, uh, you know, where are all the professionals at? You know, and, and the reason why we said that is because, uh, you know, someone was working on uh, one of our pumps and they didn't do a very good job and took no ownership of it. You know? And so, and, and the reason why I'm saying that now is because a lot of roofers, you know, in the industry, they want to replace. I want to replace. I want to replace. Has it got hail damage? Let's run through insurance. You know, and they don't know about the retail game. People buy roofs out of pocket all the time. You yeah. know, people cash check, you know, uh, you know, financing, but also repairs. Repairs are huge. Right. And I have to replace every single roof. And, you know, the profit margin on repairs are much greater. So, you know, you take like the one you were talking about, the, the roof, uh, roof renewer. Uh, rejuve, roof rejuve. Yeah. I'm not necessarily yeah. selling it. I didn't get paid to talk about it. I just find it interesting. And a guy that does coatings is going to be a little bit more 
open to listening to it. That that was part of it too. It's like open to change, open to listen. You know, you can't you can't tell me that that roof needs to be replaced because it's got streaks on it. Right. You know, or, or it's dirty. Yeah, I I don't right. believe it. So if they have a product that you can spray up there that helps and does, you know, scientifically and proven, you know, extend the, the, the life of the roof, why not use it? Right. We don't always have to hit home runs. It's, it's about the solution for the customer. Well, you're creating uh, goodwill. People are going to come back and use you. That customer is probably going to be a, a, a megaphone cheerleader for you, right? That, that said, hey, this guy, you know, this guy wants to replace it. This guy said I could just clean it and let it go for another eight years. You'll hear from them. They'll tell They'll recommend people to you. This guy was honest, honest with me. Honesty is something that's missing nowadays. And if people, if people feel honesty or think they've got someone who's honest, like a podcast, like podcast people that are honest or like Joe, Rowe, everybody loves these people. You know, it's like, this guy's telling the truth. This is so, a rarity. It's a rare deal. Yeah. So if I can get a roofer over and I don't feel like he was trying to get one over on me, I'm going to tell my family about him. This guy seemed legit. Why don't you call him out? Well, you could get a bid from anybody, but they might screw you around. Um, and I don't, I don't think people realize how big of a deal that is either. But again, most people who are going to stay in business are going to take that attitude eventually though. You know, they're going to, they're going to respect their company, the clients, their roof system, their products, and they're going to internalize it and live that life in order to in order to have their business continue. Otherwise, they're not going to stay in business very long. Um, if they just have people out there slamming sales, they'll they'll go to business and start up again. Yeah. And that's not worth it either. Like when when people build a brand like Roof Central, um, it keeps you from having to start up again or living for the next storm. You know, you're, you, if you have a brand, you're going to sell when there is no storm, those cash roof fires, repairs and replacements are going to come through, even if you don't have a storm year. And, and I don't know how old you are, Justin, but you, you don't want to run storms at some point in your life. You know, you want to run. A yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not a hustler anymore. I'm like a, you know, a strategist, you know, like I want to strategize and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and hustling isn't a long-term game and not not normally a profitable deal even the hustling guy can't slow down enough to even invest his money once he makes it so he's gonna probably depart from his from his profits from a storm if he's hustling hardcore you know i've watched it it happened to me you know i um i had the uh uh, you know, I, I was blessed to be able to run a company with, you know, 30 people and, uh, you know, we made a lot of money in, in three years time and, you know, it, uh, but it's out, you know, and I, I lost my, uh, you know, I lost myself in it, you know, caring about the money aspect of it. And I see guys do it, you know, I see them get in here and it's quick money and they don't care about the customer, you know, they, they care about them and the money and their big jacked up truck with the wheels. And Yeah. They, I talk about, have you ever heard me talking about the trucks and all that? I mean, People buy the wrong thing, but a, a lot of roofers reminded me of remind me of pro ballers. So they're they're young and they got a lot of testosterone. They go out and they they hit a storm and make millions, and then it's all just gone. And they're like, what 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 happened? And the difference in the roofer is that they can do it again. The baller busts his knee up and can't play football anymore, and his his twelve million dollars is gone. The roofer goes out and makes like 1 million, 1.2 million on one hailstorm net profit. And he buys the F-250, 350, a boat, a lake house, a second, third location, a receptionist, yeah. and it's just gone. And then they and then they start running around, want, you know, getting mad at everybody from the Martin guy like me to their wife or somebody else and wondering why they can't live life like that there's a hailstorm every year, you know? Um, but I think it takes that first storm for people to lose their money to be like, okay, if I have two more hailstorms, if, if, if I get blessed with two more hailstorms, I think I could retire, but I know I need to invest it and not raise my expense structure. So let's talk about that for a minute. Cause I, I always find this part of it fascinating. You and I are sitting here on a podcast to, to at least I, I, I like, uh, I, I quote Jordan Peterson a lot. Um, but we're at least going down a road. You know, he said, if you, if you don't know what you're, if you don't know what something is, but you think you might like it, or it might be helpful, go down the road and you get somewhere. So 
you and I are, are investing and doing a podcast going down this road, but um, I always, you know, and it may not benefit us today uh, monetarily, but how do you, I, I, I'm involved in many facets of my business. One thing where I'm contrary to a lot of preaching about business success or coaching is that they'll say, hey, Nolan, go delegate everything. Um, delegate the sale, delegate your personality, delegate this, delegate that, delegate, get an accountant, get infrastructure. And I'm like, well, your money's gone if you do all that to me. So one thing I'm, I'm very much a contrarian is like, no, I stay involved. I talk to clients. I work my business. I'm on top of everybody. And only when I've done that, Justin, am I heavily profitable. Um, yeah. That's where I, I'm different. Now, some other guys will fight me on this and say, no, no, I'm doing this, that, and the other. I'm not telling you that I don't have infrastructure. There's like 15, 20 people behind me. Um, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not doing like, I'm not, I hate bean counting. I hate certain things, but where I know I've got talent in, I'm in the game. But tell me what you do to like keep expenses low, profits high, if you don't mind sharing some of that stuff. You don't have to give me exact numbers, but like, what would you recommend to people or have, because you've had to have been through this before, but are you, do you worry about this kind of stuff, like a profit margin on a job and not having your profits eroded at the end of the year on that sort of I, stuff? I, uh, I did it wrong for years and I, uh, it's probably blows some people's minds, but I didn't know the difference between margin, you know, and markup, you know, and, and, you know, even gross and even net really, you know, until honestly last year. Um, and, uh, we started it, it to me, it starts on the micro level. So in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, profitability, uh, you know, in a company and, and keeping a hold of things, um, it starts at the micro level, you know, uh, is the job profitable? You know, what's our cost in the job, you know, essentially pre-capping it before you even do it, especially with insurance work. You know, you want to make sure that job is, you know, profitable according to what your overhead is, right. you know, look, got a building several trucks on the road you know you got a bunch of w-2 employees you know your uh your overhead may be higher you know so what does your gross margin need to be in order for that business to you know to survive and just break even every month and then at what point it, does the cream happen you know because yeah. that, that's really important. you know you want to get to that cream point to where you actually have net profits each month right you know not just uh you know, not just look at the end of the year, end of the quarter or whatever. And it starts at the micro level, you know? Yeah. And it's it, it, So, so roofers that get to make money have to be hardcore about job costing each individual job. And then you're going to have to take that and look at that in a, in relationship to your expenses. Probably good to know what your monthly overall nut is that you're paying out. And then yep. to scrutinize that my business is a little bit different in that I, I have clients and then I have money in and I know what my expense, it's pretty fixed. And so, yeah. I, and a lot of people get off in the weeds here and say, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. You probably have to job cost your material, your labor. You got to get that right. But yep. you don't have to be perfect on other stuff. You can scan your debits and look at your monthly nut. So if you if you have somebody do a balance sheet for each month, have you know, your accountant can spit that out and go, or you or if you don't have this, if you keep your credit cards paid and your um, and any credit accounts for materials paid, you can just say I, I deposited this much money and and I took out this much money. So there's some easier ways for guys to get around this. My dad's a CPA, and honestly, Justin, I was horrible at this forever because I didn't like to do any of this part of it. I'm an entrepreneur, not a bean counter, you know. So, yeah, but if yeah. you could, you can look at some simple measurements, and I always called it so the. This is one of the main things for me. This is, um, I did not buy this pen. I bought this pen. And th these are, you talk about small things. It, it goes down into the fabric of my bean because I, I lost so much money. I had millions in the bank and I think I dwindled it down to less than a million dollars back in like 0, 03, 04, 05. And the money went away because I didn't invest in myself, right? Yeah. So this is a fancy pen. This is the cheapest big pen you can buy. These used to have a, these used to be white with black lettering on it and then a black cap. And, um, and then they moved them to this little thing that moved here. I remember one time and I was booming in business and I let 
uh, an office personnel do the office shopping. They would go into Office Depot back then, and uh, she would buy way more expensive pens than this. Fancy, what I call fancy pens. Also, yeah. look at things like uh, how thick is a milliliter? How thick is it? If, if I get paper to this day and it's thick, I I kind of look at it and I'm like, who the hell bought the thick paper? You know. <laughs> Um, but so those things, and the reason I look at that stuff, I remember throwing away stackable trays, uh, back in the day before computers, people just buy stacking trays. If they didn't know what to do with something, they just throw it in the tray. I had yeah. a room full of hundreds of trays one time that we threw in a dumpster, filled a dumpster up those fancy pens. I spent about $200 a month on them back in 05. And so, yeah, those little things matter. And then, um, well, and, and so it, it's it's very uh yeah so as you grow you have to compartmentalize everything you know so not only do you have to uh you know understand at the micro level exactly what you're making on that job before you even build it how really? fast can you get it done because if you have net 30s at you know these different uh suppliers the the if you can beat net 30 you you've you've invested nothing into it you know other than your labor right you know goal is you know to start at that micro level and understand each one of your sort of compartments in the business you know you got the sale you know you got the you know the the bookkeeping and you know you got the you know production operations you know all that right. and they each have to be very compartmentalized you know in order for you to grow and each you know department or compartment you know will will work together you know for the greater good to be able to move jobs you know through that pipeline successfully not only profitable, profitable, but also, you know, successfully, and, you know, to where all the way to the end of it, you got a, a great customer and right. then they turn and, and they leave reviews for your brand. So each, all of this stuff ties into each other, you know, and unfortunately, you know, you, you may get into business because let's say you really like roofing, you know, some of the old school guys, they just love swinging hammer and, you know, doing repairs. They had a passion for it. But, you know, as you start to grow, you got to understand sales psychology you got to understand bookkeeping. Well, now you got your taxes to do. You got to talk to an accountant. You got to be, you know, be a little bit involved with that. So I, I firmly believe that, you know, each uh, each part of the business is very compartmentalized. So what you do is you put people in these different compartments, departments, and it's their highest and best use. They enjoy doing it. Right. And then they're off between these different departments. So in this is part of who not, who not how so you bring in the right people into the into that department but you you don't you don't turn loose of it entirely but that person does a good job you check in on them every once in a while all these people you placed you can handle that in meetings and you know reports and things like that you know mm -hmm. rapport in the company and culture and just checking in you right. know you know generally with your business as it grows i know um, a guy, uh, uh, Derek, uh, God, I forget his last name. I, I know of him. We've talked once or twice, but he owns a company called Ridge Valley. And he's told my partner before, Hey, look, this thing would operate without me. You know, if I die tomorrow, it'll operate without me. It'd be great <laughs> if you could actually get to that point. I'm, my personal feeling on that is that it, you're, it might operate without you for a little while, but you're going to have to get in there. Somebody, his presence is still there. You've still got to have a hand on it and be the wall that backs it up. Everything ultimately there, is on the owner. There's a there's a book out there called Leadership You, and it talks about the stages uh, of of yourself as you you know sort of run a business. You know, going from entrepreneur to inf influencer to visionary. Right. And I believe that stage really is truly a you know a motivator and a visionary of a company. Yeah, uh, you know, you're you're not spending your time really going around and making sure people are doing things right and you know reprimand mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, you're going around just checking on them, you know, right. you're, you're seeing how their day was, how are they doing in their position? What do right. they think? You know, you're motivating and you see a vision for the company eventually when you get to that point, but you have to go through all these stages, you know, because uh, initially you're, you're sort of like, uh, uh, you know, ADD bipolar in a way. You're the, where you you're the student. You're not the master. Oh. Yeah. You, you have to become the student, be the student before you can be the master. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's impossible to manage somebody if you don't go through and learn everything, right? So if you run a successful business with multiple employees, multiple divisions and all that, your highest and best use will change over the years. It does. You may put it out on the roof, nailing shingles, but you're not doing that today. Correct. You know, you, 
into it every now and then and enjoy it or something. But you have basically been in everybody's position before. So that's yeah. why you're a visionary. You're able to lead all those different, you know, uh, areas of your business. That's very and, well said. Very well and, said. Nolan Walker here for Roofing Webmasters. You may not know, but I own a digital marketing agency named Roofing Webmasters. We've been doing this for 12 years. I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of roofers. We've got hundreds of satisfied clients right now, and we'd love to add you to our client mix. I tell you what, we'll help you with your design, your content, your code base, your SEO, your ranking on Google, your map ranking, all that stuff. We also have software called DataPens that we wrap into it. We are one of the only legit agencies out there that actually help people. Everybody that we have is month to month for a monthly fee on an ongoing basis. You'll get an assigned account rep and our team of 15 people will help you get as dominant as we can. If you've never had proper digital marketing agency support, you owe it to yourself to call us at Roofing Webmasters or email. Look us up online, roofingwebmasters.com and give us a call when you're ready. You know, one other thing about all this that I'd like to say, and I, I made this mistake. I viewed my business, which I'm supposed to legally, but I probably a little bit too much that it's a separate entity. So if you're incorporated, you're an LLC, that is a separate entity. It has to do with piercing of the corporate veil and other things. You cannot use your business like your personal bank account, right? Because it'll pierce the corporate veil. But I would take an income from the business. So I would pay myself. So I think this is one thing that I messed up so badly uh, for so many years. Back when I had tons of money, I viewed that money through that business and took out income. I did finally do a distribution of that money, but I didn't invest it. So the money that came, comes through the corporation that flows through is a flow through, pass through income or income. It's essentially income and it gets taxed horribly, right? You have some, some sort of stuff with S corps and some other things, or maybe like a write off, like a roof on your commercial building or something, but you're gonna get taxed pretty hard when it flows through to your person, right? And yeah. it's not a passive income, it's not real estate income, it's not uh, capital gains, it's, it's just a hardcore tax and there's no other money coming from it, it's sitting there in the bank or somewhere. So I, I when someone gets money, they need to have a plan to invest it, right? There's got, you're gonna buy real estate, rental homes, do forced equity on uh, apartment units, whatever it is, they've got to do something, but I didn't do anything. And so I view it a little bit differently now Then the difference is I don't just look at the money of the entity of the business to expand it. A lot of that money is mine as the business owner and it needs to be invested so that I get a different type of money generated that's not all income because the income is difficult to generate long, long term, regardless of how well you're going to run your business, someday you're going to need passive income, capital gains, taxed income, you know, different types of income that are working for you. And I always talk about Robert Kiyosaki, the definition of that getting out of the rat race, right? So that my passive income that's coming in, if you, I don't really call stuff passive, you got to work at every bit of income you have. You can't just let money sit very easily, yeah. right? But, um, but that money is easier What's that? Residual income. Yeah, that money's different. And then you, and then it's higher than your uh, cost of living, right? What, what yeah. You're not that it takes up. But that was a huge point for me. And I guess it always like ask people like, do you have a plan for stuff? Like, are you into real estate or rentals or anything? Do you do that kind of stuff as well? Are you planning on it? I am. Um... So I, I lost everything two years ago, uh, divorce, lost a, a large business, um, you know, ha really had no energy to fight it. So, um, you know, I, I, right now I'm rebuilding and I, you know, I have some, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, my home is, is, I have quite a bit of equity in my home now, which right. is one, uh, you know, but God only knows the market can crash, you know, but, yeah. you know. So I, right now I invest in people. That's what I do. I'm rebuilding. I remember how to do it. I remember how to do it all. And, uh, right. you know, my 
to invest in people. And when I do that every single time, the return is great. So right now I'm just focusing on my return and actually getting the money and then I'll make that decision. But it's, uh, it's very important not to get lost, uh, you know, as you're, you know, going through your, your roofing journey. Cause I, I, I would venture to guess most of the people that, that would be looking at this podcast are guys that are, you know, trying to, you know, make something of themselves in this industry and they're looking for ideas and they're just, you know, young minds and, and whatnot. I'm still that way myself, still learning, but I learn from my mistakes. And, you know, one thing I could say is don't, don't get sidetracked. Wait till you have the money until you can do something with it, right. you know, and, and ask a good accountant, get a good bookkeeper, you know, and, uh, and then start making those investments. I, um, unfortunately, again, I, I lost everything two years ago. I'm rebuilding very happy about that actually, but I, uh, I am not to a point right now where I can invest. I appreciate you sharing. I, um, I guess back when I had the home security company, I had expanded so much, lost a ton of money, not on just expansion and expenses. It wasn't anything crazy, you know, always, I always used to think of, you know, people, I had so much money coming in, you would have thought I was snorting cocaine and buying Ferraris. It wasn't even close. You know, I, I wasn't spending a dime. I mean, I was just like uh, too large of an office, salespeople answering the phone, you know, like stuff just deraveling. We had this weird thing happen after 9-11 where people bought home security and then it went off a cliff. People stopped buying as much. So a lot of more people bought and then four or five years later, they stopped the extra buying and we were expanded with expenses and it's problematic, you know? Um, so I lost a ton of it, shut a business down. I went in through a couple of, I bought like a, a, a very expensive Lubentun place. I had a quick car. I don't know if they have those there in that part of the uh, country, but I, we had a, I had a quick car Lubentun and we didn't, I hated it. I hated that business so much. I started up the digital marketing agency, but it, if anybody changes that oil, uh, pl pulls that oil plug, they're almost always an ex-con, almost always. And I, I was like, hey, I've dealt, I've dealt with alarm installers. I can deal with mechanics. And no, those people aren't the same. You know, and it wasn't, I'm not saying they're all bad, yeah. but enough of them were bad that it made my life hell. I didn't want to manage them. And so I was like, oh, I deal with these people. But that business made money. And I sold it and I went into, this was years ago and I went into digital marketing and did other stuff. So everybody's got their story from painting curves, mowing lawns, raking leaves, and then going through ups and downs. And it takes this life of experience to finally pull it together. And then things start to happen quickly. Normally when you're, when you're on the money and you begin to invest, it's boom, boom, boom. And people always look in there like, Hey, Justin, how'd you do that? You make it look so easy. It's so easy for you. I wish, I wish I had it easy like Justin. I wish I had it easy like Nolan, but it wasn't, it yeah. wasn't like that. I, I didn't ever have like eureka moments like Nolan, how'd you get to do this? Or how'd you get to do that? Like, man, it was just like one excruciating step after another. Sometimes I wish I had looked back and go almost our digital marketing agency back from 2000 and you know, four, I didn't start it till 2010 or 11, you know, it was, it took me forever. Like, Hey, I should do this. Instead, I went and bought an oil change place. It was horrible experience. I had that for two and a half years. I paid a 1% SBA penalty for selling it early and 7% to a business broker. And I walked out of that business, even though I sold it for a little bit more money with a $200,000 loss. So that, mm -hmm. because I was passionate about getting out of there and starting a new business. And, yeah, then I took, yeah. and then I didn't take a paycheck for three and a half years, by the way, uh, in the business that I'm in now that's very successful. And now I'm working on software and other things. And so thing, and, and as soon as I think I'm going to quit, it's like, eh, you know, I, I had I had a friend of mine say, oh, we're thinking about quitting. I won't even say what business they're in, but uh, we're thinking about hanging it up and retiring. They're like 30, two or three. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to retire, huh? And I was like, and I was like, hey, if you don't mind, how much money you got, you know? And they're like, sure. he shared with me a little bit of stuff. I was like, man, you're not even close. I said, you, you need like triple, quadruple what you think you need. You need other stuff set up. You're not even close. Um, and they didn't get rid of, they had this money train going. But um, every time I see somebody that thinks they're ready to retire, unless they're really old or really set themselves up, which is very few people, um, they are back in the business that they were once in trying to get back into it 
like almost so they sell their business. I think they're done. No, you don't have 25 uh, homeowner units being, you don't have at $15,000 a month coming in from everything. You don't have some extra money in stocks. You don't have uh, a lifestyle that you can live off of $7,000 a month and be happy. You know, you just don't have any of that stuff or any way to even ride inflation. Like you have to have stocks or real estate to buffer inflation, you know, as you go. You can't go live off a reverse mortgage. You know? Yeah, I, um, yeah. It, it's hard to even build a business and sell it, honestly, um, yeah. I, in my opinion, especially a roofing business, unless you actually have something, you know, physical location, trucks on the road, a great brand that just ain't going nowhere that people will remember for years and years. And, you know, I, I've, I've talked to guys before and like, yeah, I might I think about just selling this. Well, what's there to sell? Yeah. You know, I remember uh, back in the day, you know, when I owned Ready Roofing, like, I had guys that, you know, had, had approached me like, Hey, you know, if you're wanting to get into the Charlotte market or this market or whatever, why don't you just, just buy my brand? And, you know, and I, I would tell them like, well, there's really no need for me to do that because I can come in there and set up my brand for way less and, and just start, you know, yeah. get it right away. And so, you know, in order to have a dream where you're going to sell a business, you better start at the micro level. I'm going to tell you that you better know where every transaction goes, yeah. what your marketing is, what the return is on it. Because anybody that buys a company, they're smart, you know, and they look at those things. And I'm going to tell you what, you better not lie. You better have your books together and you better do it right as soon as you can, as close to the beginning as you can. Because if yeah, not, it'll be terrible. There's, um, I, I, I've sold business. I've had an SBA loan and I've sold a business, that quick card that I have. Okay, so if, if SBA or a bank's going to get money, what Justin's talking about, is a hard asset like real estate. They can wrap a loan around the hard asset and bump a little bit extra to what they call blue sky. Blue sky is just money up in the air. Money's just coming in, but nothing supports it. Money's just flying in based upon Justin's great ability to manage a business. But if he, if he didn't have a process, a procedure, anything, the bank wouldn't loan anything for this. And then it'd be scary for anybody to buy it, right? So you have... You have a system set up with enough that somebody's like, gosh, this thing's been going for eight years, 10 years. This guy's done 10,000 roofs, 5,000 roofs. He's got repeat business. He's got a dominant website and optimization. And he's got these five people who not have people in place. And yeah, I'll pay him a three multiple for it. And one thing that sucks about all this, three, four, maybe, but he'd be lucky to get a three multiple for that. Because at some point in time, somebody's just going to say, I'm going to go sell it. But at some point in time, you might want to take the three multiple. And the other part about this that I've heard before, which I truly believe in, because when I went to sell my businesses, sell, run your business like you're going to sell it, even if you never sell it, because then it's profitable and ready to go. And it makes money. If you don't run your business like you're going to sell it, you're not scrutinizing it hard enough from the eyes of an investor. And you may never sell it. But at least if you run your business like you're going to sell it, you're profitable. Nobody wants to buy a non-profitable business with no procedures, right? So, There's a lot of guys out there that have no clue what they make. They yeah. don't even they don't even know if they are profitable. And yeah, so yeah, you, you got to have all that stuff in place. And you know, just like you know, your SOP, standard operating procedure. Right. Believe it or, we have all the processes in place. We don't have an SOP right now. I don't I don't have it all lined up. You know, lined up and written. You know, all out in SOP. That's something we're working on. And you yeah. know what it changes? You it know does. what when you start offering, you know, uh, you know, roof washes and stuff, you know, you got to add something different in there. How are you selling it? How's it, how you buying it? How's it coming through? You know, like, and so I think your business as you, uh, you know, as you, as you go throughout its life, it changes, you know, it, it really, and you know, the people in it change and you change and the economy changes and the, the innovation changes and you have to tweak and right. um, keep something the same. And, and when it works, yeah, you know, it's what I call you rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. But, you know, you, you have to be smart enough to know when you need to tweak that. Right. And you know, tweak it based on, you know, new things in the industry, the market or, you know, what's you know trending and, and all that. Every once in a while, you got to shake yourself off and say, man, it's been five years. I haven't changed. Uh, let me look around, make sure I've been resistant. And you start bad mouthing a new product or something. Right. And you're like, no. I probably shouldn't have done that. I need to get on board with that product or at least go get trained on it and check it out a little further because yeah. a lot of people are starting to, because you'll get left behind at some point. You can either become the goat 
the greatest of all times if you get older and you're experienced and you know everything, or you can peter out of business and just be like, that guy got old and less and not relevant. He's gone now, you know, soured, yeah. uh, negative and gone. I, I have to constantly come in, especially with what I do for a living and say, no, nah, I'm going to do it. I came in the other day. I told my wife, I said, well, she said, how'd it go? I said, well, I'm doing good doing good. I said, I guess I'm doing this now. And, and I said, I, I learned something. And she's like, you're always on it. And I said, I am always on it, but you always got to stay on it. So, but every time you, I think about 10 years ago, I said, well, one of these days I get to quit learning stuff. I know so much, but the beatings never stop. If you want to yeah. be the best, the new stuff you learn never stops. And I'm, you constantly got to innovate and change, but, um, you do. And, you know, it's uh, with what you're involved in. And I think why you and I have a, a, a good relationship is because, you know, I understand that things take time. You know, there's so many people in the industry now that, you know, the first question they may ask you is, well, you know, what, what, what type of return am I going to get on that? You know, if, if I spend this much on Google, am I going to get a return? Yeah, people are short sighted about the overall vision of their company. And while you may not have a traditional mark, uh, I don't have a traditional business plan right this second, but I know what the vision is for everything that I'm doing and I'm willing to fight for it. You know, most people don't, most people won't fight for marketing. I, I was talking about this the other day, Justin, I think less than 2% of roofers fight for a proper branded business, less yeah. than 2%. Do you, I, don't, I doubt anybody's fighting as hard as you are in your, do you, is anybody fighting to your extent for a brand, maybe one or two other guys. I know one other company in your um, market, in my market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I would consider that, that is doing that. Um, however, um, you know, your web presence and what's on your website goes beyond just the way it looks. Number one it, sure. it's it's about how it performs and it's about what's on it, you know, and it's not about like looking like the next roofer. You, you look at, it, most roofing websites now they're they're garbage you know they're four or five pages and it, it's literally a brochure nobody ever goes to it and maybe every now and then you get a lead you know right and you know you do have to fight hard you know and you have to you know be able to overcome adversity you know like you know our learning center we just launched um mm -hmm. you know i think that's a little bit different you know from what you guys are, are typically used to but it's it's yeah. a you know, a vision of mine and michael's and you know we want to do it and it's, it's starting to render you know good results and but it takes time you know, yeah. and it takes to communicate with you guys to be able to, you know, to, to get it to line up and all work right. But it's 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 well worth it, you know, in the end. And you do. You do have to fight for it. You have to put work into it. You know, you have to, you know, you have to essentially help to, to build the ship, you know, the design of it at least. And then once it's sailing, you get somebody to steer it, you know. Right. As, there's, there's so much positive toxicity going out there around right now you now where oh the next book's going to do it the next podcast is going to do it oh if i listen to this guy oh let me try out this guy what he thinks and this girl and this person right it, it all lies within yourself period point blank period it does you got to dig deep you know figure out what makes you happy what what you want in your life and then just go that direction you know as hard as you can and get surround yourself with good people. You know, the next podcast ain't going to do it. The next, uh, you know, person who promises you great results on Google is not going to do it. Running an ad is not going to do it. You know, it's yourself and the value and, and you know, the vision of, of your business. Yeah. And it works if you, if you stay on it, it does. I, it, it, I will, I will admit at 49 years old, I'm, I'm successful and I'm very successful and I want more, you know, I'm a capitalist. I want more. I want, I was listening to, uh, oh gosh, who was it? Uh, what's the MMA guy, the Irish guy that beat up everybody. I can't remember his name. Oh, Connor McGregor. Connor McGregor. He was like, he said, I'm the whale. I want it all. I want my fair due. I want my due. I'm going to get it. You know, I'm getting it now. And like, I feel that way. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business owner. I'm an American capitalist. I'm an entrepreneur. I want more. You know, I just want more and I'm willing to fight for it, but I don't like, I, I always look at it this way too. People sometimes look at me and say, Oh, why do you work still? Or why don't you do this or that? And I was like, well, I'm going to probably work like a, at least a 40 hour week, no matter what doing something. And as long as I'm in here, I give all that I can give, you know, I work and fight and have some passion for it. Other people come in and they give less than all they can give and they get what they deserve out of that. That's the way it all works. But I like well, you, going forward, getting better. 
getting more, you know, well, it's fun. I have a passion for something besides the money. That's the key. Yeah. Nolan Walker here for Data Pens, D A T A P I N S, that's datapens.com. It is software that was literally made for a roofer for ultimate organic domination. You can put it on every phone you have out in the field. There's also a desktop version of it. Anybody can use it. It takes 90 seconds. You take up to six photos of a job, write a quick caption like roof replacement with GAF HD Timberline shingles. You put in your client's cell phone and or email and tag your roof replacement page and your city page and hit pin. It automatically grabs the geo coordinates, wraps it in schema, looks like a red pin drop, but it, to Google, it looks like a digital hand raise. Hey Google, we were here. By the way, here's several photos of the job, which by the way, count as unique content. And here's what we did, a roof replacement with GAF HD Timberline shingles. Also, it posts back to the Google account itself with the caption and the photos, and it shoots an email and text back to the client saying, please review us on Google or BBB with a couple of links and choices of review sites. All this is awesome stuff. So now regularly, imagine having this done 30 times, 50 times a month, and Google sees fresh content, fresh pictures, fresh geo coordinates. Even if a client doesn't leave you a review, which nine out of 10 probably won't, every client becomes valuable to you at this point because you're getting valuable organic signaling. A geo coordinate as a digital hand raise, this validates your map area and with fewer reviews helps you go into the pack three map rankings. It also expands the amount of times a map can show up because of the organic keywords and the keywords help the organic underneath the map show up as well. Data pens is simply fantastic fantastic. It makes blogging look horrible. This is the type of signaling that helps people get dominant on Google. And if you've never gotten dominant on mapping and organic and reputation reviews on Google, you've got to try data pens. Look it up, datapens.com. If you're interested, call us or email us. We'll see you later. If, if you have a passion for money, I'm sorry, it's not going to last for you. And you're probably going to be the same person you were now as, as you will be in 20 years. And nobody's going to like you. You know, because it's not about the money, it's about the value, you know, and, and, and what you can do. And then the money comes, you know, and like you look at like, uh, what was it Van Gogh said? Uh, you know, I, I poured my heart, my soul into my, my art, you know, which is my life's work. And I lost my mind in the process. <laughs> yeah. You gotta lose your mind. You know, if, if right. you're, if it's about money, you're, you're not really in it. Yeah. You, right. You'll get that call from that client at, at 12 o'clock. It's got a, a leaky roof and you'll leave them stranded you don't care you care right. about the money. you know you right. don't care about who it is that, that you're working with and uh unfortunately we live in an, an instant society you know with like tiktoks and you know eight second reels and they're they're getting these dopamine hits and i'm right. gonna tell you what you know, survive the punches of of, of of being an entrepreneurship and it's all about the money uh you, you just need to get out now because you're, you're gonna have downs where you want to quit but the important part is is when, is when you have those ups and how you utilize them and it you know mistakes. You've made some good points there. If you don't, if you're not, if you don't care about the customer and their dollar spent, you're going to, I mean, really care. Like if somebody spent good money and if you don't provide a good product in return, you're not going to stay in business. I, I will say that like, it's not money specifically, it's lifestyle and freedom. Um, and I would argue to, like you said earlier that the goals change as you reach different levels. So you might become more humanitarian or do something different or wanna help other people. But in the beginning, it's freedom and lifestyle and the feeling of success and accomplishment. I think I yeah. think most men need that. Like I need to feel like I'm doing something beneficial and helping to provide for, for my family and uh, you know, my, um, my family, my kids, you know, uh, legacy something. I need to feel like I built something. I like to do yeah. stuff like that. And then, but you're not going to get there if you're just wanting money. And if you don't care about the client and you have to like, for me, it's lifestyle and freedom, you know, lifestyle and freedom is worth it. Cause you don't have to work as much. You can have a different life, but then I don't have freedom. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't build something. I don't have money to do or resources to do something else. So I, I don't buy like really expensive cars still because I've got so much other stuff I want.
you know, I want, I want other lifestyle things. Once I get my lifestyle perfect, then I'll bring in, you know, an ex, a, a nice car to drive or something, a nicer car than I have. But uh, not, anyway, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I think you've got your head screwed on very well on it, Justin. It sounds like um, things are on the right path. Um, what, what do you, what do you see? I, I, well, first off, one more thing we got, I, I thought we were going to end up earlier and we had some interesting conversations. Do you have any really bad stories or great stories that you would share without hurting and, you know, without telling anybody his name, like I'm talking bad jobs gone bad, employees gone bad, subs gone bad, um, or good or good. You got any interesting roof stories? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'll actually tell a bad story because I think there's too many good ones out there. <laughs> All right. I like the bad one. Everybody likes these. Yeah. You know, everybody tells these good stories. They're killing it. They're crushing it. Everything went perfect, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just not always that way, you know? Uh, yeah. I'll tell a story and I won't mention any names, but okay. I, I recently um, uh, surrendered a, a, a job we were working on out of town. Um, and um, yeah, first time in my life I've ever done it. And, um, you know, I had all kind of feelings about it. You know, my go-to is anger. You know, I struggle with anger, anger issues. I want to act like I'm in control. I'm not, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had some emotions there. You know, this job was, uh, we started it last year. It was a coding. And, uh, you know, we, we ran to our weather window and we couldn't code anymore. And not only that, there were other trades on this project. And uh, it was just really messing with us. We couldn't get our work done. Then I had a bad applicator who put some uh, coding on, you know, thinner, uh, than what should have been. And, uh, you know, we tried to make it right. We said, Hey, we'll come back in the spring. You know, we came back in the spring and, um, we just, we couldn't get along, uh, with the other uh, contractor we were working with. And there was just a big difference of opinion. Some things they were right about some things we agreed to disagree on. And, um, you know, just two days ago, um, I lost big money on this project and, uh, and it hurt. And I had some emotions about it, and uh, but I really had to to look uh, at myself and, and what went wrong, and 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 have extreme ownership. And uh, yesterday, I called the owner of that uh, that contracting company, and I apologized to him. And I That's asked for good. good for you. Yeah. yeah, I asked for forgiveness, and you know, I told him, I said, "Hey, man, I, I know we're we're breaking this contract, and I'm getting out of it, and you're you're getting another person to finish it. I just, you know, man, I'm sorry it turned out this way." Uh, expressed to him, you know, my feelings. He expressed to me his. It's, you know, no hard feelings. He shared with me some of his experiences in business and <clears throat> wished me the best. And, you know, and, and we will line up again at some point, you know, later. But uh, so it hurt. Yeah, that, that's a great story. I appreciate you sharing. So I, I had something similar happen. I won't go into detail in mine, but I, I basically I didn't care about people and their money. And, you know, I was in home security. I was a kid. I was 20 five or 27. And I had a moment where this lady cried. I wasn't doing right by her. Um, the job had taken a week. She was recently widowed. She wanted a full perimeter alarm system. And I said, Hey, the, I, I fired the technician that was screwing up the job. And I got over there and got my hands dirty and called in a favor and went over myself and learned how to install that alarm system and, and gave her a bunch of free equipment apologized for my behavior and the way that my company had run and my business took off like a rocket in years that followed. But it wasn't until that time you apologizing to somebody for doing something wrong. And, and that is one of the most beneficial things in my opinion, that somebody can do to own an owner. Always for me, if something goes wrong, they're saying, Oh, so-and-so did it. And I was like, that's my fault. They're like, so oh, that's their, no, it's not. At the end of the day, I, I run the show around here. I hired that person. I let that person, you know, I, but when you take that kind of ownership, the business goes, well, I'll tell you a really funny story on one of mine real quick. If you have any others you can share, but um, I fired a kid um, a long time ago in home security. And we had an office that uh, was like suites on either side. And there was a hallway in the middle and there was a code to get in like an old mag lock code. And, um, I'm pretty sure it was this guy, but I never realized, figured out who it was. Um, somebody took a dump in front of my front door in my business. <laughs> I mean, a massive human dump. I mean, it was like this. Oh. It was it was horrible. <laughs> what in so, the world, man? I've had people try to beat me up. I'm sure you have too. Like, I'm going to kick your, you know, your ass and all that. But 
some of the stories are funnier than others. I've I've banged on people's door. They're hung over like get you know beer bottles all over their truck and my equipment yeah. back there i mean all kinds of things happen over 40 you know well 35 years in business you know but crapping literally crapping on my front door um that, that was that a kind of question what you did like what did i do to this person like oh my I, god but then it goes back to, yeah, they're probably a little crazy. I was probably a bad breakup guy back then. Like, you know, like if I fired somebody, it was with prejudice. You know, I was young with a lot of testosterone and I don't sugarcoat stuff. And people got mad at me. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he was angry. I mean, he deserved to be fired. I don't even know if it was the guy I'm thinking about because we didn't have, there were no cameras in the hallways. And somebody that ran a nursing school across the hall had to clean it up. Um, took a picture of it for me to see beforehand, but it was cleaned up before we got in the office because all these uh, nurse students were coming in. Um, oh, yeah. So, but anyway. well, man, I, listen, I appreciate you sharing with me. Um, I, I really do. I, I think you're on a great path. I, I appreciate all this stuff, but this is this is good stuff. It's kind of the basis for entrepreneurship. I I believe you'll get what you want on everything that you're doing. It just it is, it is unfortunate that we have to learn so many lessons, all of us, like all, all I don't, I, I, I talked to a kid the other day um, who seemed to have it all right, but I'd like to see where he is 10 years from now. You know, he's 26 years old, had him on a podcast. He was making all the right moves. The only thing that I saw that he was doing wrong, that he had visions of five locations without investing money first and probably going to lose all of it. <laughs> When he does that, but he might make it. I think every once in a while, there's somebody that can do infrastructure and run a bunch of service people. But most of the time, when you try to run too big of a service industry, it falls apart. Hence, there's no national company that runs residential roofing, right? Because it's too hard to run it once it gets too big. But somewhere in what somebody can run, there's massive profits within roofing. And if they handle their money right, they can retire and have a fabulous life out of it. And that, that's kind of, that's, that's what I hope for you and everybody, like all roofers, I want all of them to do well. Um, the truth is, and you come on and help people and just to do a podcast like this, there's probably like one or 2% of the roofers that will ever even put up a decent fight against you. Anybody fighting like you or would fight like me, there's just almost no competition, you know? I want to say this too. I, I am, uh, I don't consider myself anything special. I've failed a ton and I would not be able to do this without everyone involved on my team on the roof central side, you know, Michael, you know, uh, you know, Michael Miller, Michael Childers, uh, you know, Ollie, uh, Philip, you know, Nate, I mean, you know, everybody who's involved that, you know, we're vulnerable with each other. We pray with each other. We're very real. You know, I'd like to think we're, we're unlike any other company that's out there. And uh, there, there's no way I could I could do it without those guys and the people in my life, you know, uh, that inspire me, you know, yeah. and uh, there's there's no way everybody can talk and talk and, you know, be like, oh, it all hinges on Justin. No, it really doesn't. I, I can't make the moves that I make without the backup that I have. And then sometimes they stand in front of me, you know, yeah. and uh, my girlfriend, Mary Lee, you know, is a beautiful human being. You know, I just I have days of depression, mm -hmm. anxiety. You know, I'm like everybody else. I look, I didn't want to get up this morning. You know, I didn't yeah. sleep very well. And I start off with negative thoughts. And so I I, I would end like this on my end. I, I would really encourage everyone to just be real and and stop caring about what's out there in the world on social and what's trending and you know, yeah. being all funny and, and, and try to break off and do something different, you know. Yeah. And and, and be proud of what you do, you know. And uh, if you're having trouble, get some help, you know, and admit your faults and, you know, make amends with people in life. It's, it's just too short. It is too short. I, I, I like that. I appreciate it. Yeah, people, I, I talk a lot about people getting a mentor or a coach or something to get through some of the stuff. stuff. I, I used to have a ton of negative self-talk, by the way, Justin. I, I mainly eradicated that. I think we all have these problems, you know, a lot of us. Um, but it took years and years and years to get good enough to, to fix this stuff, but nobody's perfect. You got to keep working on yourself. 
uh, definitely dealing with other human beings where, where I don't, I don't know where that's going to go someday with AI, but we all obviously need to work with each other, you know? So, um, everybody's so interconnected with everything and, and definitely with a roofing business. I think people, people get in there and have to have a little bit of a team to help them. You know, there's gotta be some good people you're working with. You can't carry it all by yourself. You may be responsible for all of it, but you can't do all of it, you know? So. Leadership You is a good book, and, you know, it talks about leading through vulnerability, and uh, I'd recommend that to anyone who's having. I'm going to order. Know. I ordered your last book that you recommended to me. I'll order that book. i tell you one thing, um, by the way, on a different note, at 49 years old, health is a huge thing to me, um, and the, my, I, I'm reading uh, um, Dave Ashbury's book, uh, Bulletproof, and I'm reading Life Force by Tony Robbins. Life Force by Tony Robbins, if you're starting to have some aches and pains and you want to live like a very, very uh, he healthy lifestyle, I'm going to the bio conference in Beverly Hills in September that Dave Ashbury puts on, all about high-end health. And so at my age, it's all about staying healthy and continuing to grow. And yep. so, yeah, if, if I had to tell you to read any of these, it'd probably be... Um, Oh, and I'm reading uh, Car The Carnivore Way with uh, Paul Saladino. If you, Paul Saladino, uh, that one is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I think it's The Carnivore Way or something, but it's Paul Saladino. I think it's his only book. Uh, it's Salad, S-A-L-A-D-I-N-O, Paul Saladino. Uh, you can order it on uh, Amazon, but um, that one's huge. I'll order Leadership You. Uh, as well. And I appreciate it. But guys, yeah, um, yeah this was Justin Woodruff, Roof Central out of Clayton, North Carolina. Justin, I, I appreciate you uh, so much. I really do. Thanks for opening up. I love it when guys open up a little bit and are a little bit more vulnerable. I tend to do that myself, but most people put on a mask and the podcast isn't as interesting when they do that. <laughs> so Real life, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Call me anytime and uh, we'll see you. Thanks, right, thanks no, for coming thanks. on. All Have right. a good one. Bye-bye.